Good afternoon. It's a great, uh, well, it's not a pleasure. I think it would be bizarre to say that it was a pleasure to chair uh, a discussion of, of genocide in Ukraine's history. Let me say that it's a, a privilege and an honor to be here uh, in uh, the Ukraine House. Let me pay tribute to Victor Pinchuk and everybody at his foundation for the extraordinary work that they've done. Uh, this exhibition is for me by far the most memorable thing about this year's World Economic Forum. And I'm very proud to be a part of the effort to raise awareness and also to maintain awareness of what is going on uh, in Ukraine, not only amongst the kind of people who come to the World Economic Forum, but further through the media to the world as a whole. With that having been said, I'm going to introduce uh, our two uh, expert speakers. Um, I, by the way, am Neil Ferguson. I'm a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution. I claim no expertise on Ukrainian history, uh, though I have written on the question of, of genocide uh, in my book, The War of the World. Uh, but I'm here to moderate. My role is to ask more or less intelligent questions of the experts, and then to invite you later on in the course of this hour to put questions to them yourselves. To my left is Serhii Ploki, Professor of Ukrainian History at Harvard and also Director of the Ukrainian Research Institute. He and I were colleagues, a happy time when I was also at Harvard. Uh, if you don't know uh, Serhii's work, you are not well informed on the history of Ukraine. Uh, and of course, his range is uh, much greater than the history of Ukraine. I'll, I'll mention a, a couple of his books. Atoms and Ashes, A Global History of nu Nuclear Disasters, uh, which was published just last year. Uh, the Frontline Essays on Ukraine's Past and Present. Uh, he's won numerous awards, uh, including the Bailey Gifford Prize and the Shevchenko National Prize, which he won in 2018. Uh, to his left, uh, it's uh, a privilege to introduce uh, Boris Gudziak, the Met Metropolitan Archbishop of Philadelphia uh, for Ukrainian Catholics in the United States and president of the Ukrainian Catholic University, uh, also the founder of the Institute of, of Church History. Uh, he is the author of uh, the Kiev Metropolis, the Constantinople Patriarchate and Genesis of the Breast Union. Uh, please welcome our two distinguished speakers with a round of applause. <laughs> Let me begin uh, with you, Sarhi. I want to ask a question about genocide as a concept. Because often I think when the word is used, many people think of the Nazi extermination camps. And they assume that genocide simply means the physical annihilation of a people. But that's not quite right, is it? That the term has a somewhat more subtle and, and broader meaning than that. Uh, yes, yes, indeed. Uh, the, uh, very, very often when people hear about genocide, they think about Holocaust, right? And uh, genocide is a term that, again, certainly can include Holocaust, but it also has different different dimensions. And if you Google right now genocide, probably what you will get at the very top would be a very short definition that genocide is intentional destruction of a group, ethnic or other group, uh, with the purpose of, of, uh, of, of alienating of a particular, of particular group or nation. And uh, the question is intentional. And that's, that's where, where many discussions and debates are uh, being held, including on the Yugoslavia, including on, on uh, um, the uh, Cam Cambodia, Cambodian genocide. And, uh, so there are different, different definitions. And discussion about uh, Ukrainian famine of 32-34 as a genocide or not genocide is very much focused on the issue of intentionality and very much focused on, okay, how many people died or didn't die. In real terms, that, or in terms of def defining the genocide, that really doesn't mean much, the, the number per se. And the 
person who defined the concept of genocide, who came up with the Raphael Lemkin, who um, again the, the, the uh, uh, ideas ideas partially came from his his study at at. Uh, Lviv University, so he is not foreign to, to Ukraine per se. He was thinking about the famine, the Holodomor, as a genocide, but defining it not just as the killing or the death by hunger of so and so many people, millions, uh, again, and millions. But he was thinking about that as a combination of a number of factors the uh, attack on the Ukrainian culture, liquidation of the Ukrainian churches in the uh, early 1930s, the attack on the Ukrainian uh, political elite at that time, that was already communist elite, and again, Skripnik is one of the representatives of it, and the destruction of the peasantry. So that didn't get it into the UN resolution, because UN resolution, it's like in that joke, what is, what is a camel, this is a horse created by the committee. Mm. So someone was adding something, others were retracting, the Soviets were there certainly to make sure that the definition of the genocide can't be used against them. But if you look at what the father of the term genocide was thinking about, about uh, again, one of the tragic episodes of Ukrainian history, of Volodymyr in particular, he looked at that as, as a combination of factors. And again, cultural factors were an important part of that. And that's, that's, that's again, uh, addressing the issue of the complexity of the term, relation of Ukraine to that term. But Ukraine, unfortunately, has not been uh, a stranger to, to genocides in principle, again, defined, defined in, in different terms from the uh, Holodomor of 32-33, looking at the, at the Holocaust, where Ukraine is one of the principal killing fields of the Holocaust, with, again, anywhere between, again, every, at least every tenth uh, person who died in the Holocaust came from Ukraine or had some relation to Ukraine. And now we have, we, we are again in a situation of, of attempts to annihilate, annihilate the country, nation, culture, identity. And uh, uh, that's, that's again for, for someone like myself, like a historian, uh, it's also uh, not just a emotional shock and, and tragedy, but it's also a, a sort of an intellectual disappointment because somehow you believe that we as humankind learn from, the, from what happened in the past. And what happens today in Ukraine tells us that maybe some of us learn, others don't learn at all or learn completely, completely wrong lessons. And uh, uh, I, I guess that's, that's the task, first of all, of, of people writing history and talking about history. The, we have to work harder. Well, let, let me follow up with you before I turn to Metropolitan Boris. Why is it that Ukraine has had such a bloody history, as you, as you just pointed out, uh, the 1930s to the 1940s saw appalling, organized, lethal violence uh, on the territory of Ukraine. You and I have spent years of our lives puzzling over this question. When I wrote The War of the World, the way I put it was, if you look at 20th century violence, an incredible proportion of it took place in an approximate triangle between the Baltic, the Balkans, and the Black Sea. Therefore, a very large amount of the organized lethal violence of the 20th century happened in Ukraine. Uh, whereas, comparatively, little of it happened in, in North America. And now here we are, sitting in a building which houses shocking, unforgettable images of organized lethal violence that happened in the past 11 months. Do you find yourself feeling that Ukraine is in some kind of historical doom loop? Why does this keep happening? And why has it proved impossible, apparently impossible, to learn from history, 
to avoid this terrible thing repeating itself. I remember reading about Raphael Lemkin when Samantha Power published A Problem from Hell. I saw Samantha wandering around the Congress Center earlier this week, and that was where I first encountered Lemkin's contribution. The theme of that book was never again, because it was happening in Bosnia at that time. And here we are, uh, years later, and we seem to have made no great progress mm. in Eastern Europe. Why do you think that is? Do you have an answer to the question of this recurrent cycle of violence? Uh, well, Neil, I have an answer, and it will, it will be probably interesting for the audience. It will be disappointing for you. The answer comes very much from, the, from your book. Because if you, if you still remember what you were writing there was that World War II, the, the, the most of the violence was taking place in Eastern Europe and in China. And the argument, if I understood it correctly, was about the geopolitical vacuum. The disintegration of the empires and the, creation, uh, the, the crisis of the Chinese empire and disintegration of the empires in Eastern Europe. So the rise of very weak states that were trying also to, to bite more than they, than they, they can chew in terms of minorities, and the revanchism of the, of the old powers that were fighting, fighting over those story, territories, which comes to the fight between historic Russia, which became the Soviet Union, and Germany. That's, that's, that's the battleground. Now, uh, if uh, one believes in what you, what you wrote, what that means, why Ukraine is in this predicament, and again, uh, uh, all of these three cases, again, the, 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 the uh, uh, Holocaust, the, the Holodomor, and the, the current genocide or genocide, genocidal actions, are taking place to a different degree within the context of the war. Because Holodomor is basically the result of the war fought by the Ukrainian states and the war that was lost to the, to, 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 to the Russian Empire. The, the World War II and, and Holocaust, again, that's, that's obvious. And today we are talking about the war as well. So war and genocide in, diff in different variations come, come together. And what you need for that not to happen and what you need to change the predicament, not just of Ukraine, the predicament of the region, because the argument here is, okay, if... If, if Ukraine would fall, the next would be uh, Eastern Europe, right? So it's not just about Ukraine. So the way to get out of there is actually a strong national solidarity, national identity, strong state that is able actually to defend itself. The situation in which what you described as the vacuum, a power vacuum, would not exist, would not exist in Ukraine. And what I see, uh, again, in, 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 I, I, I uh, ended the response to the first question with disappointment on, on many levels. Uh, wh what I see in terms of silver lining and some hope is that what is happening in Ukraine is the formation of a particular nation and particular type of, of, of uh, community and statehood that is not allowing and will not allow in vacuum, geopolitical vacuum, to be centered uh, in that country or in that region. It's a, a fascinating argument that, in the end, this attempt at the destruction of Ukraine as a state and as a culture is going to backfire completely. Absolutely. Because Ukraine appears to me to have been fully born as a nation in the past 11 months. And we see for the first time the prospect of a strong Ukrainian state, which clearly was not uh, firmly established after 1991. It astounded me uh, to hear Henry Kissinger uh, in December uh, make the argument, which he subsequently published in The Spectator, that, it, that Ukraine would emerge from the war as a strong power, one of the strongest powers uh, of Central and Eastern Europe. So this could be one of the most unintended consequences in uh, the history of Russian aggression. Let me turn to the moral dimension here, Metropolitan Good, uh, Boris, if I may. It seems to me that genocide is to be understood partly in, in moral terms, because to commit an act of genocide is surely to 
a commit an immoral and sinful act. And that the regimes in history which have carried out genocide have, I think, without exception, been atheistical regimes. Regimes committed in some way or another to a non-Christian ideology. Am I right in thinking of genocide as a kind of crime against morality as well as a crime against humanity? So there are various kinds of political circumstances in one, second, or third other case that uh, condition a genocide. What is always present is the desire of a group to conquer, dominate, and maybe destroy and eliminate another group. So one way of not having genocide is working to make sure that this kind of destructive and as you said, sinful intention is somehow obviated, somehow um, uh, prevented. Um, Ukraine has had neighbors uh, in distant history, but uh, particularly in recent history, that have uh, considered it their prerogative, their right, to own Ukraine, to dominate Ukraine. And to do so in such a way that enhances uh, their national identity, glory, economic, political, military power. Whether it was the Nazis or the Soviets, as cases uh, in point. Uh, what has happened, This uh, the vacuum of empires has been replaced by nation states. So the Ottoman Empire fell apart, the Austrian Empire fell apart, uh, the French, Belgian colonial systems uh, fell apart, the German Reich uh, failed, and finally the English Empire uh, fell apart. What did not fall apart is the Russian Empire. It partially splintered. 15 countries emerged in 1991. And this is a big problem for Putin. Uh, it's the greatest tragedy of the 20th century. Somewhere, at least subconsciously, somewhere in that logic, uh, there is a clarity that if Russia falls apart more completely as an empire, it will not be able to conquer. In, in my um, earlier intervention, um, you know, I shared just the basic biblical um, truth that sin is basically a grab. Adam grabs for something that when God is giving. And it's so much better when we can live in a polity, in a society, in a culture as mutual givers. And I think there's a beauty in <laughs> the post-World War II lessons that have been uh, applied, not always perfectly, but uh, with much peaceful consequence in Europe, um, in this country, in the European Union. I don't know that there's much nostalgia in um, the United Kingdom for empire. I think a young Brit today would uh, be aghast at the idea of enslaving the Irish. It's interesting you and, say that because the New York Times loves to argue that there is nostalgia for empire in Britain. It's one of the ways in which they've covered Brexit for the last six years. And it's not true. You're quite right. There is almost no nostalgia and a great deal of, of hostility uh, to empire. You'll find many, many more negative portrayals of the British Empire on television, on the BBC, than positive. So for me, Britain is, is a country that has overcome that imperial legacy. I don't think that's true of Russia. No, it isn't. And of course, uh, uh, you know, it always helps to construct kind of analogies. Uh, can we imagine uh, Brits today <coughs> saying, yes, we have to uh, dominate uh, not only Ireland, but India, 
uh, it's good to have, uh, you know, Australia, Canada. It's good to have an empire that the sun never sets on. And if necessary, you know, we're going to wipe out whole populations to maintain that. Because that is exactly what is happening right now. And there is a deep pathology, uh, not only in the head of Putin, not only in the KGB structure that is uh, kind of the continuation of uh, uh, the Soviet uh, legacy, but it's deep in Russian culture. I mean, many Russians find it difficult to accept Ukrainian identity, Ukrainian national uh, purpose. Um, 700 university rectors signed a letter of support of this war. Nobody in the Russian Orthodox Church at the level of leadership is uh, speaking out against the war, and Patriarch Kirill is distorting um, theology, uh, justifying what is going on in Ukraine. What is going on in Ukraine? There's genocidal aspects, because Putin has been very clear, there really was no Ukraine. It's kind of a fake. What exists now is pathetic. It's a failed, failed state, failed nation, a failed culture. This was the argument of his essay that he published last year on the, the historic historical unity. essay, and it was reiterated in a violent, uh, um, vulgar way on Monday before the invasion on on, yeah. um, on uh, Thursday in February. And so. Um, and Timothy Snyder has, you know, spoken about this and written uh, very eloquently that uh, you, you can annihilate when you dehumanize. Yeah. So what has been, uh, the Ukrainians are Nazis. Uh, and this is, this is an achievement of anti-genocidal activism. Nazism is maybe the one taboo that globally is condemned. Almost nothing else is like it. You can't get anywhere as a Nazi. Uh, in the West, in the East, a Nazi is a monster. And if you are a Nazi, you're a monster, and killing you is not uh, a problem, it's, it's actually a mission. And we see that uh, what happened in the occupied territories, in Bucha, in Irpin, uh, what happened in Mariupol. A city that is, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, city, maybe the most Russian-speaking city in Ukraine. Uh, over 40% ethnic Russians before the war. Before the war. And in terms of uh, linguistic culture, uh, dominantly, uh, predominantly a Russian. So what do you do to save Russian speakers in Ukraine? You kill the Russian speakers in Mariupol. Uh, uh, what is the reason? We have to reconstitute empire. And where did that um, Russian world idea come from? It actually came from Patriarch Kirill, who in the 2000s formulated this idea of Russian world wherever the Russian Orthodox Church had a presence in history, in imperial history. This is our canonical territory. This is our cultural hegemony. It is one Russian world. And this became a convenient uh, ideological construct taken over by Putin. Uh, and it is being used now to justify genocide. And it is tragic for, 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 for the Christian presence in Russia, for the Russian Orthodox Church, uh, that the church is engaged in, in, this, in, in, in this ideological uh, construct. And this reminds us that Although there were clearly anti-Christian elements in National Socialism, particularly amongst the most radical Nazis, uh, the uh, Evangelical Lutheran Church did and was complicit uh, in the Third Reich. So we shouldn't entirely be surprised at this, uh, this conjunction. You've hit on a very, very important point, which I was hoping someone would make, that you have to dehumanize your targets before genocide is possible. The perpetrators have somehow to believe that they are not dealing with fellow humans. 
And this is one of the most striking features of the genocides of the 20th century. In all of the different settings, one finds a language calculated to dehumanize. This was, of course, what the Nazis did to the Jews, but it was not only done uh, to the Jews. So let me turn back to you. One of the paradoxes that I remember exploring in the War of the World, yes, it was a long time ago, but I just about remember, was that genocides can emerge in societies that seem to be quite ethnically mixed. And for me, the great and shocking realization was that levels of intermarriage between Germans and Jews were at a very high level in the 1920s. That in fact, the Jews were more integrated into Germany than they were into many other European countries on the eve of Hitler's coming to power. When one turns to contemporary Ukraine, it's often been observed that there was a considerable mixing of Russian and Ukrainian identity. Anecdote, I'm getting my hair cut in London by a Slovakian barber who complains about Ukrainian refugees in Slovakia in the following way. As far as my father is concerned, they're just Russians. They're just the people who did it to us in 1968. So from a Slovakian point of view, it's not even clear that there is a difference between Russians and Ukrainians. You have studied this uh, more deeply than anyone I know. Help us understand the relationship between Ukrainian and Russian identity, and then to explain how this process could come about that, that Russian soldiers could go into Butcher and come conduct this hideous massacre. I've been watching the, the videos, footage of what was done, and I, I still find myself asking the question, how can they be doing this to people who are really basically the same as them? Is this, is this a story of the narcissism of small differences, that the differences are actually trivial and yet become the basis for violence? How do we think about this phenomenon that genocide can arise from apparently integrated societies? Well, uh, the, again, we, we talked about that. The the idea, the justification of the war is um, Russians and Ukrainians are one and the same people. So that means not that Russians are really Ukrainians. That means that Ukrainians are really Russians. They don't have right to exist. But still, it's you're, you're going theoretically to liberate your own people. And that's, that's deep belief, it's not just pretense, because on that belief is based the entire military operation. With the idea that everyone will be welcoming you with flowers. There is a number of nationalist battalions that would continue resistance, but again, that's, that's another 10 days. And then how you turn from going and liberating your own people into, into committing these this, uh, atrocious acts. Uh, and uh, dehumanization, which, which again achieved through, this, through, the, uh, through the use of the uh, Nazi and, and, and uh, Nazi terminology, and again, uh, Metropolitan Boris uh, talked about that. But there is also one more layer to that. The <clears throat> uh, Putin comes to Ukraine with the idea that uh, language equals culture, that culture equals uh, basically your loyalty, your state loyalty. So if you speak Russian, uh, you are Russian, and if you are Russian, your loyalty is to, to Mother Russia. And uh, he faces in, in Ukraine a reality in which Ukraine survived in 2014, 2015, and surviving today and fighting back by crossing this linguistic and ethnic and religious lines. This is a different form of nation and national identity, completely in opposite to the idea that language defines who you are. And uh, Natalia Homenyuk probably somewhere in the, in, in the room, but again, I learned that from her and then I who found that more and more in the interviews conducted by other journalists, very often when 
people in Ukraine on the front lines or in the rear are just asked what, what you're fighting for, define what is Ukraine. The word that comes to the fore is freedom. And it's, 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 it's not just a value, it's not just a general abstract, it's, it's an everyday life that, and, and your freedom is, 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 is taken away from you. So it's, it's, it's a very different model of Ukrainian nation that actually also uh, is being formed by the war formation started earlier, formed by the war, and that, that will certainly, that will certainly uh, survive and, 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 and emerge victorious. Um, and just one, one comment on, on, on the Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, the, the first, uh, at least recorded, case that I know of uh, Putin saying about Russians and Ukrainians and so on and the same people comes from the summer of 2013, when he, together with Patriarch uh, Kirill, comes to, to uh, Kiev, and this is done all at the conference arranged for him, uh, it seems to me, at the Kiev and Kiev's monastery. So that's, that's a direct connection between the, the Russian world, the idea of one um, indivisible Russian nation with the great Russians, little Russians, and, and, and white Russians. And one of the reasons for that is that this ideology is actually not just imperialist, it is imperial in its origins. That's the view of Russia pre-1917. And the Russian Orthodox Church is the, the only institution that survived through the Soviet period without actually formally admitting that Ukrainians do, do exist as a nation. Even party was organized according to the, there was the Communist Party of Ukraine, part of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, but the church itself, it stayed to be Ruska Pravoslavna Tserkev. So from that point of view, the, the, this, this imperial, imperial model, imperial matrix that, that the church preserved in itself, now serves as a, as a uh, foundation, justification, legitimization of uh, of, of, of a genocide, because if anyone seriously believes in what Putin is saying, and part of Russians believe that, okay, Russians and Ukrainians are one of the same people, you are committing genocide against your own nation. And this is one of the paradoxes <clears throat> of the entire enterprise. Uh, one thing that I think we should talk about, and let me uh, put this to you, a Metropolitan Boris, is Ukraine's own uh, history in connection with the Holocaust. One of the things that has most impressed me about contemporary Ukraine has been the effort to come to terms with the reality of the Holocaust, because it was not only carried out on part on Ukrainian territory, but Ukrainians were also involved in uh, as perpetrators. Do you think do you think contemporary Ukrainians have come to terms with the part that some Ukrainians played in the Holocaust? Because that coming to terms with the past seems to me an extremely important part of the process of, of modernization. One comes to the ideal of, of liberty and democracy, but one also comes to terms with the past. Do you think that has happened in Ukraine? I think of the work that Viktor Pinchuk has done on the Babi Yar uh, Memorial, a hugely impressive achievement. The fact that the president of Ukraine is himself Jewish, is the kind of thing that would have seemed unimaginable in the 1940s. Do you think ordinary Ukrainians have come to terms with that part of their history? I think the coming to terms with all parts of history is still an ongoing process, uh, because history was hermetically sealed, at least large topics and, and themes. Um, I think there's great progress. The most important progress is the uh, decrease in anti-Semitism. Uh, um, Jews in Ukraine, uh, international observers, uh, I think universally uh, acknowledge uh, a rather low level of anti-Semitism in Ukraine. In fact, right now in the United States, there's, there's a real uptick uh, in, in many other countries. Yes. Uh, President Zelensky, as a Jewish Ukrainian, was not only elected, he was elected with a 73% uh, majority. Uh, his 
Jewish uh, identity was not a concern. Yeah. It was not neither you know, a positive nor a negative. He was viewed as a Ukrainian and as a person. Um, I think working with students, working with politicians, working with business uh, for decades in Ukraine, I think the traumas of Ukrainian history have not fully been dealt with. Uh, they're not fully identified. Uh, you can gauge it, uh, I think, by the level of trust. Everybody will comment that in the past there has been a great deficit of trust in Ukrainian society. Why is that? My belief is that the genocidal waves, the violence, whether it's, you know, Russian against Ukrainians, you, Poles against Ukrainians and vice versa, uh, anti-Semitic violence, um, all of that, when it surrounds a person, when over multiple generations, there is systemic violence that kills systematically. It is natural and healthy to develop defense mechanisms. A mask, a facade, a wall. Different barriers between you and the other, because the other is dangerous. Particularly from the Stasi archives, we know that um, many wives and husbands were uh, reporting on each other. Um, we know the cases from the Politburo, um, where one, the husband was a member and the wife was in the gulag. Uh, the, the mistrust, the fear, I think, in post-totalitarian, post-genocidal societies is very deep. And I think it is one of the main issues blocking real flourishing of two billion people that live between Estonia and Albania and China and Vietnam. Uh, it has to be named. Until very recently in the Donbass, there was a large percentage, maybe you can name it, of people that denied the Holodomor, denied their own genocide. Yeah. Uh, I think war is a great accelerator, and I think this war will accelerate these processes. And I think the solidarity of, of a political nation is uh, becoming ever stronger. Yeah. Uh, the, the acceptance, uh, the pride in a Jewish president will affect the understanding of the Holocaust. Because what is difficult, I think, for perpetrators, it's a very shameful thing to be descendants of perpetrators. And when your identity is assailed, when your identity is not buffeted, guaranteed, protected, for example, by a state, by a normal functioning of your culture, any acknowledgement of weakness becomes more difficult. Any acknowledgement of a shameful uh, moment or process or, or trend uh, in your historical past is, is, um, is something you do with great difficulty. And that, of course, explains why a characteristic feature of Putin's regime is to shut down historical inquiry into uh, the, the genocidal or democidal policies of, uh, of the Stalinist regime, the closing down of memorial, uh, as an example. I'm conscious that we have 20 minutes uh, time left, and what I'd like to do is give uh, our audience a chance to ask, uh, ask questions. Uh, I'm hoping there's a roving microphone so that uh, the questions can be clearly heard at the back. Uh, there is. It's just coming. I think the first hand that went up was down here, uh, on the front row, and then I saw a gentleman right at the back uh, who could be next. Please. 
Hello. Uh, thank you for the uh, such an interesting and insightful discussion. Uh, my name is Lyubomir Kuziv. Um, I wanted to ask, um, actually, uh, all of you, if I if I may, about the, uh, the the Russian Church, which calls itself for some reason the Ukrainian Church of Moscow Patriarchy in in Ukraine. And obviously, there was a you know historic event, um, which uh, was with um, you know the service being held in in Lavra for the first time, you know, since since independence. And there are like various um, views on how 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 that should be dealt with. Yeah. So so w certain people think, okay, this is a separate. You don't want to go into that um, area. Uh, you know, as a, as a, as a um, state to to basically command and and try to to kind of figure out what to do with the church. Yeah. So leave it alone, and it will kind of you know, resolve itself. Other people are saying this is the, the best time, the perfect time actually now to, to go and do something about it because this is a um, an influence basically of, of a foreign and of, of actually the, the aggressor state which which has a very big impact on your on your country. So I was wondering how how are you looking at uh, how, how would well, what would be your views on that and what could or should be done, if anything, you know, with, with this particular uh, issue. Thank you. Well, I'm confident that Metropolitan Boris has a view on that. Uh, so perhaps he should go first and then I'm... Shared I'm some views. City definitely has views, I think, as I'm well. I'm sure he does too. Uh, this is probably the first time that I'm trying to articulate them. Uh, so it... Uh, uh, maybe I will have to edit the transcript, but... Um, <clears throat> I think his Beatitude Svetoslav Shuchuk very recently in these days, I haven't seen the text, but somebody reported to me, said, we need to, you know, the state, uh, the society needs to be careful that um, outlawing the Moscow Patriarchate jurisdiction of Ukrainian orthodoxy will probably make a martyr of that church. And I think there's an important insight in that. Um, Said he, I don't want to use your ammunition, but I will, you know, uh, attribute it to Said he in our conversation. He was saying, you know, some of this rhetoric around this is eerily analogous to the rhetoric used in the liquidation of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church in 1946. That being said, during war, it is inconceivable to not react at uh, uh, examples of collaboration with the aggressor nation. And there are many examples, and there is um, not only examples of, let's say, informational collaboration or even tactical collaboration, but there is this ideological um, expression of the Russian world, of the Russian imperial, uh, let's say, ideology that has been characteristic of an important part of the life of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate in Ukraine. And it's clear that that kind of rhetoric, that kind of ideology leads to death. It leads to destruction. It leads to genocide. So anything that leads to genocide needs to be dealt with. How to do this uh, is, is uh, a very careful matter. It needs to be dealt with immediately. It probably needs to be dealt progressively. Uh, it needs to be done in a legal way because the whole Ukrainian struggle and its international validity is based on defending international law, defending human rights. Uh, so I'm just mentioning principles now, not strategies or tactics. There is a big problem. It needs to be recognized. There are many members of the Moscow Patriot jurisdiction in Ukraine are recognizing it, and they are voting with their feet. They are leaving that jurisdiction whether they're going to the street church down the street or and so because many people who claim to be who say they're orthodox for example Lukashenko are not necessarily practicing orthodox as it is with many confessions globally 
Uh, so some are going to the other jurisdiction, the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, which is gaining social, let's say, ad adhesion and popularity. Others are just uh, declaring, you know, I don't support this church. I support uh, the church that is separate uh, from, from Moscow. Um, this whole process that is so accelerated by war will take time also after war. And it's important to see what, um, what things can do with, be, be done with the flick of a switch from on to off, from plus to minus. What things are almost metallic, that they can be bent, maybe broken. And what things are of the heart, of the spirit, what things are deep inside people. And those type of things can only be changed through a patient process, through a process that is, uh, in the end, uh, very, very large-hearted, very noble, and really based on the truth, on rights, on values. Sorry, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, yes. Uh, well, I... I uh, there is war going on, right? And war started back in 2014. And uh, there is a church in Ukraine, um, in terms of the parish, is probably the largest religious organization in Ukraine that uh, is in, under the jurisdiction of uh, a religious leader who is basically a strong supporter of the, of the war and provides ideology for that war. And uh, there is enormous pressure on that church to, to take a position. And um, I see that, that uh, issue being um, defined on three levels. One level is the state. And the state is there to basically assure the, the security of the citizens and look into the issues of uh, individuals working or not working in favor of the aggressor. And whether this individual is a um, bishop or, or priest in this jurisdiction or that jurisdiction, it doesn't matter whether this is individual is the, the uh, member of the Ukrainian security service who is uh, caring about security of another country. Again, uh, from that point of view, there is no difference. There are citizens of Ukraine and there, are, uh, there is the state, and that's the relation between the state and individual members of the church. Another level is society. Ukraine... Uh, survived in 2014. It fights today because of this very close link and cooperation. Ukrainian society discovered a state and state instruments and state institutions as an important way of protect itself, and the state discovered the society, and they worked together. And the role of society to, to decide whether, whether this is the sort of the jurisdiction that you want to belong to. It's not, it's not the role of the state, despite the fact that they work closely together. And that's, that's the role of society. And it's not through legal measures, administrative measures, or any other measures. That's, that's where people want to, to belong. They, they have the right to belong to those churches. That's also one of the elements what the war is waged uh, for. And then finally, the, church, the, the, the issue of the, of the church itself. And its relationship to the uh, to the uh, Moscow Patriarchate, and the position that it takes or doesn't take, which of course will have a major influence on relationship between the church and society. So uh, I would I would basically here very clearly distinguish between define not just the role of the state but also the limits of that role. But also I think that the the society has the decisive role the most important role in defining what will be happening with that church. And uh, uh, the church will have either respond to that societal challenge or probably would be, would be really um, going from the, from the, at least in the number of the parishes, the largest 
organization go into being completely marginalized. Thanks. Let me take well, another question. I, by the way, I didn't need it. Let me, <laughs> thank you. Let me go uh, to the back. The gentleman uh, in the, uh, the three-piece suit uh, is next. We actually have a, now quite a few questions. And, and what I'm going to suggest, because we have nine minutes left, I'll be, I'll is, is very brief. We'll, we'll take four quick questions, one after the other, and then we'll try to wrap this. Otherwise, we're never going to get through many questions. Please I'll go I'll be ahead. very brief. Uh, my name is uh, Dimitri Shushlo. I'm uh, vice chairman of uh, Ukraxin Bank. Um, interestingly, last year I had an uh, INSEAD reunion uh, in Fontainebleau in, in July. And, of course, we were discussing Ukraine with my fellow uh, INSEAD cohort. Um, and we're discussing the uh, arguments uh, provided by the Russian Federation against uh, the U Ukrainians, saying that they're Nazis, so we are fighting the Nazis. But that's the narrative. Uh, what I wanted to say is that the narrative that is uh, broadcasted to the European audience. Because one of my fellow uh, um, from the INSEAD, uh, Adla Klasnik, told me, and he lives in Qatar, so he lives in the, uh, in the Middle East, and he told me, you know, in the Qatar, in the Middle East, it's the opposite. The Russian propaganda puts the accent on the Jews. So the Jews are the culprits uh, of this war, and those are uh, the ones who have been fought by the Russian Federation, because, of course, the president of Ukraine is a Jew, and he's... Uh, let's say, supported by Soros and, and etc. So, I mean, the, um, let's say, uh, the, 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 the vicious narratives of the Russian is also adapting to the audience. So whatever the Ukrainians are doing, they're always the culprits. They are, they are either Nazis or they are Jews. So they're absolute evil either for the, uh, let's say, for the, uh, the, the Western uh, the part of, uh, of Europe. Can I press you to they... come to a question just because of... No, no, it's, <laughs> no, no, it's just the remark. I mean, we were saying thank, that... Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, let, let me go to the gentleman in the middle of the second row. And then there's a, an eager lady behind him on what looks to me like the fifth or fourth or fifth row. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for the presentation, for the, for the speech. Uh, I'm Rostik. I'm the student of Geneva Business School. And since the war started, a lot of people have switched from Russian to Ukrainian. But alongside with this positive change, a uh, great uh, rivalry came in between the uh, Russian-speaking groups and Ukrainian-speaking groups and, in general, between the people. Some of them assuming that uh, we should let them speak the uh, language they have chosen to speak, some of them assuming that uh, it can be done only by positive step-by-step uh, -step propaganda, by educating people and uh, explaining why it really matters, and some of them uh, are, say, are having a really aggressive position. So my question is, uh, what is your own thoughts, how, when, and if it even be possible to be done uh, in Ukraine? Thank you. Thanks very much indeed. So how do you deal with the, the different languages in a post-war Ukraine. Uh, the lady in the uh, address in the fourth row is next. Um, hello, thank you for a very informative panel. Um, is it all right? Um, uh, Kate, a uh, futurist at Kate Goes Tech. Well, first of all, I think the uh, title of the talk would be better suited to be called Genocide in Russia's History. Uh, and the question is, um, unfortunately, there are so many uh, genocides that we know of being in Pol Pot regime, Rwanda, um, Balkans, um, but it's, it looks to me that in Russia specifically, it is a tool that is being used consistently in their history throughout Soviet regimes previously as a tactic of government building, probably state building. Is there something about Russian character or Russian identity that is prone to this genocide, in your opinion? Thank you. And uh, we'll take one final question uh, from the lady on the front row. Thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to <coughs> ask a few, uh, one question, but uh, I hope it's a very deep question. So you highlighted the topic about genocide and history. And this is an answer, what is going on now? 
because genocide against Ukrainians is an ongoing process for centuries, and Sergei mm -hmm. he, uh, knows about that very well. My family has four generations of people which were suffering because of Moscow, and it doesn't matter what was the name of that state. And when we are talking about future, because we have to think about future, we have to promote the idea about Russia, not only about Ukraine. And the question is about sustainable peace. Because post-Putin, Russia will not solve the problem because we will have new system in Moscow which will ongoing genocide about Ukrainians and it will have different forms. But all of them will be against Ukrainian identity uh, and Ukrainian choice to be a part of Western world or something like that. So my question is how to promote the idea about sustainable peace and do not think just uh, about ad hoc needs to survive today because it's not only about us and winning on the battlefield. It's about future of Russia and I believe that Ukrainians and big alliance of things Thinkers and good people of will all over the world is to be a part of building the strategy about sustainable peace for future generations. My son has 11 years old. My husband is in Ukrainian army. My grandparents uh, spent 20 years in prisons during USSR. And if this war will ongoing for eight years, my son will be a part of, law inf uh, of defense system in the future. So my question is to you, how to stop ongoing genocide, which happening with us for centuries? Well, we have three questions, which in some ways are quite closely related, and, and three minutes. So this is not going to be easy. Uh, let me recap. The question of, of rivalry between Russian speakers and, and Ukrainian speakers, which the questioner thinks has been exacerbated. The question of the historic uh, tendency of Russian regimes, whether imperial or communist, to engage in genocide. And finally, what can we do to change that if indeed there is such a recurrent tendency? Um, Metropolitan Boris, why don't you go first? We're going to have to keep it very brief because people doubtless have to go to other things. But if you could perhaps offer some reflections in answer to at least one of those questions. So we've seen incredible development of uh, uh, the political identity of U the Ukrainian nation or the na Ukrainian nation as a political nation and uh, admirable harmony among citizens of Ukraine. Uh, this process in an analogous way needs to happen in Russia. So Russia needs to be cured of its imperialism. It needs to be cured of the pathological, morally, ideologically, historically, and culturally pathological, uh, let's say, uh, stimuli towards aggression, conquest, and genocide. It has to be cured. Now, how do you cure Russia of that? Well, we have a historical precedent. Germany had to absolutely lose the war. There had to be a Nuremberg process. Germans repented over decades. And we have uh, a new Germany today, which is a constructive member of the European and global community. Will that happen with Russia in the same way? I don't know. I hope it does. I hope that Russia will catastrophically lose this war and that the loss of the war will bring a reckoning, that there will be a shattering of the empire. Because imperial, it's, it's hard to lose imperial intention when you have imperial property. Uh, let me, uh, because we're entirely out of time, give the last word to Seri Poki. I think I want to make it a historical question. Is it true to say that Russia has perennially engaged in genocide going beyond the 1917, going back in history, and, and will continue to behave that way unless there is something as dramatic as was inflicted on Germany in 1945 and subsequently? Well, uh, many people, uh, including myself, believed that uh, in 1991 history came to an end. Uh, at least in a sense that the history of the, of the violence of war 
and of history of Russia as an empire came to an end, if not, if not the victory of liberalism. And we are now 30 plus years later in clearly wake up call, if this is not a wake up call, I don't know what it is, that history matters. You can't change things in societies over, overnight and change the name and change the name of organization and declare authoritarian regime, democratic regime, and everything would be, would, would, would be good and nice. So history, history matters also in this very bad, very bad way. What we see in, in Russian history, again, uh, is, seems to be unique. It, it is not unique. We, we started our discussion talking about genocide as something that is related to the war and something that is related to the uh, imperialism and, and disintegration of empires as well. And in that sense, uh, the, the uh, um, victory for Ukraine is automatically automatically defeat not just for Russia, but for Russian, for Russian empire as such. And to a degree that empire and, and uh, genocide are connected, I would say that there would be some hope in that. But there would be no hope whatsoever, neither for Ukraine, nor for post-Soviet space or Eastern Europe, if, if we lose. We will not, but that's, that's, that's a scenario that everyone in the world has to have in mind. Conclusion, the best cure for this recurrent pattern of genocide is a Ukrainian victory and an emphatic defeat of Putin's Russia. I think pretty much everybody in the room would agree with that. Please join me in uh, applauding. <laughs>